All right, little children, all the little children can come on up. Even the big children. Can anybody think of a word or two to describe the reign of King David and King Solomon? Those two reigns? What are they like? What's a word or two we could use to describe them? Fire? Fire? I don't think so. Any other words? Salvation, Salvation to the Jews, right? Glorious. Glorious was the word that I caught, came to my mind. Anybody else? What was so glorious? What was so salvific? Salvation about their reigns? Obedience to God, right? David obeyed God and Solomon tried to obey God. By the end, he wasn't doing so good. But the obedience of David resulted, resulted in the glory of the kingdom of Israel. Remember during Solomon's reign, what was significant about Solomon's reign? Obviously, the glory. What was so unique about how he reigned? The what? The plants that he had, right? He had all kinds of interesting plants. The gold. The gold. The silver. What was silver like in the days of Solomon? Rock. It's like gravel, right? Stuff that you kick around. No big deal. They were extremely, extremely wealthy. Solomon talks about in the book of Ecclesiastes that he bought plants and he made vineyards and he bought all kinds of animals. He trained and tamed probably elephants and giraffes perhaps and, and apes and monkeys to operate in his kingdom and he had that beautiful throne that was set up, all those lions on the stairs and everything was covered in gold and this was covered in gold and he built a house for God, he built a house for his wife, he built himself a house and he just built all kinds of incredible architecture and structures and beautiful creations and in the, in the, in the temple was like gold shields and gold this and gold that Everything was glorious. And then Solomon died. And then the kingdom was split in two. And then the king started disobeying God even more than Solomon did. And they did not that which was right in the sight of God, like their father David. And they started disobeying God all over the place. And that's kind of the narrative of the rest of the story. I mean, it's a back and forth a little bit, the book of Kings and 2 Kings. But we're today we are in the book of 1 Kings chapter 15. We talked about Jeroboam a little bit last time already, and now we're still in the book of 1 Kings, and we're talking about King Jeroboam. Now in the 18th year, very interesting story, 18th year of the King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. <clears throat> Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Micaiah, or Micah. I think I'm at the wrong chapter. I am. Chapter 14, sorry. I was thinking, why does this not look right? Chapter 14. At that time, Abijah, remember Abijah was not the son of Solomon. He was the other king that reigned after Solomon died. There was Rehoboam or Jeroboam, I forget which, and then Abijah was made king. Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, sorry, I'm getting this all mixed up. Jeroboam was king. Abijah is the son of Jeroboam. Now it's straight. <clears throat> Jeroboam said to his wife, so Jeroboam knew that he couldn't go and get help because he's the king. And he had been a very bad, wicked king. But his son Abijah is sick and he doesn't know how to get help. He's disobeyed God his whole, year, his whole life. And now he wants his son to get help from God, and he doesn't dare go himself. So he says to his wife, I pray thee, disguise thyself, that thou be not known to be the wife of Jeroboam, and get thee to Shiloh. Behold, there is Ahijah the prophet, which told me that I should be king over this people. So now, during the end of his reign, perhaps, his son is very, very sick. Jeroboam remembers, I know why I'm king. I remember one day when a, a prophet came to me, that prophet Ahijah, he came to me and said, you are going to be king over the household of Israel. You're going to take the place of David. 
David's line and you're going to take over. And so now his son is sick and he says to his wife, put on a disguise. Dress yourself up so nobody knows that you're my wife and go find this prophet to see if he can do something. He's the one that said I would be king. Now my son is sick. My son should be king after me. We need some help. Not a very good story coming up. <clears throat> And, he, and take with thee ten loaves and cracknels, I'm not sure what that is, and a cruise of honey, and go to him, and he shall tell thee what shall become of the child. That's what a prophet did in those days. You go to him and say, what do we do? What does God say? How should we handle this situation? He says, my son is really sick. Take him some gifts, go to this prophet, and ask him what's going to happen to my child. And Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. But Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were set by reason of his age. So he, she didn't even need to disguise herself. She could have come in her royal robes for all this prophet cared because he couldn't see anything. But she came in, and when she saw that he was blind, she probably especially thought, oh, okay, good. Now I don't have to worry about trying to disguise my voice or hide my face. He won't know who I am. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Ahijah, Ahijah, the, the blind prophet, he said unto him, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam cometh to ask a thing of thee for her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus shalt thou say unto her, and it shall be, when she cometh in, that she shall feign herself to be another woman. <clears throat> she shall feign herself to be another woman. You know what that means, right? She's going to pretend to be somebody else. And it was so, when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet, as she came in at the door, that he said, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. That would be a surprise if you were the disguised wife, right? You walked all through the streets. Nobody knew who you were. Here you are, usually robed in royal robes, riding in a beautiful chariot, perhaps, and everybody bows down when they see you. Now she walked right through all the streets, and she was like a common person, normal. Nobody recognized. And as soon as she came into this house, she says, the prophet says, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. The blind prophet says to her. Now you really know he's a prophet, right? Because he wouldn't be able to do that <clears throat> if, he couldn't, if he couldn't see. He didn't recognize her. <clears throat> and he says, Come in, thou wife of Jeroboam. Why feignest thou thyself to be another? For I am sent to thee with heavy tidings. You know what heavy tidings are? You know what tidings are, right? We, we sing about tidings at Christmas time, right? Because that's an old word that was used a lot when they, when they wrote a lot of the old Christmas songs. Tidings of comfort and joy. It's good news, or news, and this time it's heavy tidings. So when you hear the word heavy and tidings go together, you know that the tidings, the news, is not good, right? If somebody came to your house and said, I have some very heavy tidings, they probably wouldn't say that, would they? But you would know what they mean. Heavy tidings. Have you ever felt something heavy on your chest? Where something just doesn't feel good? It feels like you're heavy, you're way down on the inside? This prophet said, I've got some heavy tidings for you. Go tell Jeroboam. So now he's sending the wife back to Jeroboam with this news, these tidings. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. You want some news from me, Jeroboam? Here is my news from God. For as much as I exalted thee, I exalted thee from among the people and made thee prince over my people Israel. God says to Jeroboam, Jeroboam, remember, I made you king. I exalted you from the people. You were just an ordinary person. I exalted you and made you a prince over my people to care for my people. And I rent the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it thee, and yet... Thou hast not been as my servant David. You didn't obey me like David did. I thought you would be a better king than Solomon's sons because Solomon's sons were up to no good. Solomon was up to no good. So I thought, I'll take Jeroboam because I want him to be more like David. And yet, you didn't be like David. You didn't obey me like David did. Who kept my commandments and who followed me with all his heart to do that only which was right in mine eyes. But thou hast done evil above all that were before thee. For thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger and has cast me behind thy back. Where did this guy put God? 
Where did Jeroboam put God? Behind his back. You know what a lot of people do? They put God in this church building or some other church building, and then they leave here and think, okay, now God is behind me. I don't have to deal with him anymore. God's behind my back. So that's probably what this guy did. He thought, you know what, there's a temple in Jerusalem. They can go worship God anytime they want. But it's much more exciting to worship this God. And so he made a molten image. He made a strange God. He set up idols in different places. And it was very exciting and fun to be a part of those things. You know, a lot of people trade in God for sports. They would rather go and play sports than worship God. I'm not saying sports are all wrong. You guys know I like sports, right? But some people, they stop going to church services. They stop worshiping God. They stop reading their Bibles because they have to practice. They have to play. They have to work hard. And now they've traded in God and put Him behind their back. And they've got something more important to do. Do you have something more important in your life than God? As soon as you have something more important in your life than God, then God has been put behind your back. And that's what Jeroboam did. He said, God, just it's not very important to me right now. I've got so many exciting things right here I've got to take care of. It's more important to me right now. And so he cast God behind his back. And God said, because you cast me behind your back and provoked me to anger, therefore, behold, I will bring evil upon the house of Jeroboam and will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall. That's a strange statement, but he's saying everybody's going to be gone. Even maybe the homeless man that doesn't have any place to use the washroom, the guy that pisseth against the wall, none of them are going to be left. All the people of Jeroboam are going to be done away with. I'm tired of this group of people. This man and all his descendants, I want nothing to do with them. They're going to be cut off. And him that is shut up and left in Israel will take away the remnant of the house of Jeroboam as a man taketh away dung till it be all gone. Who here has chickens at their house? Chickens, chickens, chickens. Who's had to clean up their poop? You have? But dogs, that's even worse. Those are nasty. You had to clean up dog poop? You like doing it? No. Not many people do. He says, that's what is going to happen to your descendants, Jeroboam. People are going to clean up your descendants like as if they're cleaning up poop. They're going to be like, oh, gross. I have to deal with this guy's stuff, and they're going to take it out and throw it out in the trash. That's that's what God says is going to happen to Jeroboam because Jeroboam cast God behind his back and set up those molten images. And then he says, he describes exactly what's going to happen. He says, him that dieth of Jeroboam, (coughs) any of Jeroboam's descendants that dieth in the city, shall the dogs eat. Do you know what's extremely disgraceful and disgusting? Death, right? Death is just really ugly. Nobody likes dead people. Nobody likes dead bodies. Dead things are not fun. But you know what's worse than dead bodies and dead things? The other day our dog killed some of our chicks and I was really angry. And so I chained him up and put the dead chicks right close to him where he couldn't quite reach them. And I put them there for a few days. Guess what happens after a few days? Flies come. And they eat some of this flesh, and then they lay eggs. Within a couple days, there's fly larvae, these ugly little worms crawling all over the place. It's really disgusting. But do you know what a dog would do if you let him loose? He'll still go and eat those dead chicks that have been dead for several days. This is a good lesson, isn't it? A lot of fun today, this morning. He says, that's what's going to happen with Jeroboam's descendants that die in the city. They're going to rot and smell and stink, and the dogs are going to come and eat the children of Jeroboam. You know, sometimes we talk about, I don't care what happens to my body when I die. Go and bury me back in the field. I don't care. But we do care a little bit. We would never want to see our children or our family members die and be left out in the field somewhere. American soldiers, Canadian soldiers, if they're fellow combat man dies in battle, do you know what they'll do? They'll go out and brace and brave the bullets. They'll go and fight, go right into the war zone and grab their man that fell down and take him out because they want to give him a proper burial. That man died a hero. We're going to bury him the way he deserves to be buried. This God is saying to Jeroboam, you want to forget me? Guess what's going to happen to your children? They're going to die in the streets, and the dogs are going to come and eat them. They're not even going to get a burial. It's going to be really bad. 
And him that dieth in the fields shall the fowls of the air eat. You guys have seen turkey vultures on the streets eating up raccoons and stuff that have died on the road? That's what's going to happen to your descendants that die out in the fields. Who wants to disobey God? Doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? This is what's going to happen to your children. And then he says to the wife, Arise thou therefore, get thee to thine own house, and when thy feet enter into the city, the child shall die, and all Israel shall mourn for him. This is something that's very curious to me, very interesting. Go back to the city. As soon as your feet get into the city, your child is going to die, and guess what? They're going to bury him. And the whole nation of Israel is going to mourn for him. That doesn't sound like what he just said, does it? He said, if somebody dies in the city, the dog's going to eat them. If somebody dies in the field, the, the birds are going to eat them. Go back to your home. As soon as you get into the city, your child is going to die, and they're going to bury him, and they're going to cry about him. You know what? If I die, if my family dies, anybody in my family dies, I hope people get together and liked them enough to where they would cry. It's, that's important, right? If somebody you know and love dies, you cry about it, you mourn about it, you have a funeral, you bury them. But he says, your children, that's not going to be the case, except for this one. This child that's sick right now, go back, he's going to die, bury him, mourn for him. All Israel shall mourn for him. And then he says, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found some good thing toward the Lord God of Israel in the house of Jeroboam. Now this, this tells me something about the mercy and goodness of God, right? Sometimes you see families, they're just completely wicked. The parents are doing drugs or drinking alcohol and they don't care for their child. The child is just left to themselves and you think, man, what a poor child. And then you see the child grow up and he's like eight years old and he's just this bitter, angry, nasty little boy. Nobody likes to be around him. And then you stop feeling sorry for the boy because he's so miserable and difficult to be with. And you're just like, that boy is wicked too. Well, this boy had wicked parents, but something about the boy impressed God enough. Now we talk all the time about God doesn't look at our works to save us, and I don't think he does. But there was something in this boy, some good thing in this boy where God looked down and said, I'm going to take this boy now before he turns wicked. I'm going to take him now before something terrible happens to him and he's going to get a burial. The city and the whole, the, the whole nation of Israel is going to mourn for this boy because there's some good thing in him. That's interesting, isn't it? That gives me hope and courage to see. When I look out into the world and I see all the terrible, evil people, sometimes I think, wow, there's no hope. God looks at them and says, I see some good thing there. This one here, I'm going to give them the gospel. Or I'm going I'm to take them early, perhaps. They're going to die early. That's a strange thought. Sometimes we mourn and mourn and mourn over a death of something, and maybe it's better that that child died. That's very hard thinking, isn't it? You know, Jesus actually said about Judas. You remember Judas, right? Who is Judas? He's the one that betrayed Jesus. Jesus says about Judas, he said, it would have been good if he had never been born. It would have been better. So, if a child dies, it's very, very sad. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, it's the better scenario. Right? In this case, it was better that this child died, had a funeral, everybody cried, and God receives this child to himself. Much better than him dying in the streets and being eaten of dogs or dying in the fields and being eaten of birds. I don't know what all the lessons are in this. And you know what's really unique to me and very interesting about the Bible? God didn't tell us theology. He didn't write down all kinds of doctrine, especially in the Old Testament. If you go to Romans and all that, then you get some good theology. But a lot of this stuff, it's just a story. And it sticks with you. You'll remember it. And whatever the doctrine is, whatever the theology is, doesn't really matter. I hope this inspires you to be one of those good boys. One of those good girls. One that God looks down and says, Ah, there's one that has a good thing in him. I like that child. I like the way he responds. I like the way she repents. I like the way she is to her sisters. I like the way she acts to her parents. That's a good one. I like him. 
That's what we want God to see, right? Moreover, the Lord shall rise him, raise him up, a king over Israel, who shall cut off from the house of Jeroboam that day. But what? Even now. For the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water. He shall root up Israel out of his, this good land which he gave to their fathers and shall scatter them beyond the river because they have made their groves provoking the Lord to anger. And he shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who did sin and made Israel to sin. And Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Tirzah. And when she came to the threshold of the door... The child died, and they buried him, and all Israel mourned for him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by the hand of his servant Ahijah the prophet. And the rest of the Acts of Jeroboam, they're written in a different book, in the Chronicles of Israel. And then the next king comes, and he does things that aren't very good. And the next king comes and talks about Jerob Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. He reigned there. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, in verse 22, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves of every high hill and under every green tree. Now listen to this in verse 24. You're going to remember a certain word's going to come up and you'll remember a story from back in the book of Genesis. And in the, in the city of Judah, in the tribes of Judah, there were also sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Who were the sodomites? Sodomites were a group of people, right? They lived in a city called Sodom. So here's people living in Judah. They're not from Sodom. Why are they called Sodomites. They're not from Sodom. I don't think they're from the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. They're wicked like the people. They're doing the same deeds that the Sodomites, Sodomites did. You know, a lot of times today we hear people refer to Hollywood as Sodom. Because there's a lot of people in Hollywood, and not just Hollywood, all over this world right now, where sodomy is becoming very, very popular. And it's becoming the cool thing to do. You know what they did in Sodom, right? When angels came, male angels, men angels came into the city of Sodom, what did the men of the city of Sodom and Gomorrah do? They came to Lot and they banged on his door. He was afraid they were going to tear his house apart. They said, give us those men that we may know them. Even all the boys and girls in the city were all just evil and wicked and they were constantly doing things that were very, very nasty. Men with men doing that which is unseemly. Even their women did change their natural use and did that which was against nature. Boys, you ever have somebody show you their private stuff? Sometimes boys want to do that. They think it's funny. They think it's cool. Girls showing things that they shouldn't show, stuff that only your mom and dad should ever see on you, and you pull down your underwear thinking it's funny. That's how Sodom started. That's the kind of stuff they were doing. What men do with their wives... The way I hug and kiss my wife and go into our bedroom and do private things and have a private, sacred spot for us, men were doing with men. Girls were doing with girls. It's no wonder God was furious with these people. It's no wonder God was so angry at them that He said, I'm going to take this land away from you. You're no longer allowed to live in the land that I gave you. I'm going to destroy you, you abominable people. You're all going to be destroyed. That's not a very fun story either, is it? But it teaches us, don't be sodomites, right? Repent. Do what is right. The beautiful thing about the whole book is that God offers forgiveness to all, even if you have done something evil, even if you have toyed with things that you shouldn't have. Even if somebody has hurt you or harmed you or done some nasty stuff to you, the grace of God through Jesus is sufficient. Jesus died and suffered on that tree so that we could be fully forgiven. Now there's three main portions, last point that I want to make, three main portions of the Bible. And we know which three portions they are, right? Because when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, 
something happened. Two men appeared with Jesus on that mountain. Who were those two men? Nope. Two men on the mountain. Nope. Do you know? Jesus was there, and then two men appeared with him on the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah. Those are the three main parts of the Bible. It doesn't say Moses, David, and Jesus. The kings were not a main part of the Bible, which is interesting to me. Moses, he gave the law. God brought them into the land that he promised with the law. That's Moses. Moses reigns, and, or the, the law of Moses is the governing thing over all of Israel. And then, when the children of Israel disobey, first of all, that they wanted to have a king, and then all these kings are wicked and evil, and the people are looking to the king to guide them, and the king constantly leads them into sin, and then one king maybe does that which was right, and then a hunt, like ten more kings do that which was evil, and then one king does what was, is right. God's not so concerned about the king, but he does say, I'm going to send them prophets. Elijah is the representative of the prophets. He comes and he warns them. He says, if you don't stop this wickedness, something's going to happen. And we see that with Ahijah in this passage. And then in the next couple chapters, we see the introduction of Elijah. And we're going to get into the prophets next time when, we, when I'm going to be speaking to you. But King Rehoboam took all the brazen shields, all the gold shields that were in the, the temple, and he made them into brass because the golden ones were stolen. So all the glory that David and Solomon had under the next couple kings was lost. They were just an ordinary kingdom. They had ordinary swords and ordinary cups and plain stuff. Now silver would be very, very valuable again. Under Solomon it was like stones. This is an extremely good lesson for us, isn't it? Do you know that we live in a very, very wealthy country, Canada and U.S.? Do you know why? Because our fathers did that which was right in the sight of God, right? Even if they weren't all Christians, they obeyed certain principles and it worked. And here we are, wonderfully rich people. Who knows, if we continue to disobey God, what might happen? I don't have God's coming with prophets the same way as He once did, do we? But Anyway, that was a kind of a mishmash of things, but thank you for paying attention and listening. Hopefully you take it into your hearts, right? Actually, let's quickly pray, okay? You guys all bow. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. We thank you, first of all, that you are a good, good God, a good Father to us, that you are merciful and kind and generous, extremely generous, that you look upon us, even in our sin, and you see that even though we have no good thing in us, you send your Son to be the good thing so that we can have righteousness given to us. We thank you for his work his shed blood, his death, his crucifixion, and also his resurrection. We look forward to when you come back and make everything right and make everything make sense to us. Help us to walk in righteousness and to obey our parents, to obey authorities, to obey the government, to do what is right and good in your eyes. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.